Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me welcome you to the uh, commercial uh, diplomacy panel, a conversation with U.S. Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker. And let's give uh, Secretary Pritzker a nice, warm uh, reception. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thank you very much for being here. I know I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. Milken and his whole crew for thanking you for being here. So we'll get right into our, our conversation. Terrific, this thank you. So my day job is normally running an exchange, not interviewing the Secretary of Commerce, but I have a little experience. I've interviewed both President Bush, President Clinton, and Secretary Clinton. So I have ah. a little experience in this, ah. uh, Madam I'm Secretary. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Let's see. Um, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about, you've had a really solid career in your business, and that mm -hmm. goes without saying. How, do, how different is it what you do as Secretary of Commerce compared to what you do in, in your day job as business before you became Secretary? Um, there are many similarities and a few differences. So when I took this job, the President asked me to do a few things. He said, first of all, I want you to build a bridge to business uh, with the business community. I want you to make sure the voice of business is heard within my administration, and I want you to be the chief commercial advocate on behalf of American business. So there's a real... The chief commercial advocate part is, uh, you know, I'm a salesman for American business around the world as well as an advocate for uh, what American businesses need around the world. In terms of the policy side, though, as a member of the president's economic team, that's new and different. And the third thing to keep in mind is, it's, you know, people say, oh, we should have more CEOs in Washington. And I think that's true, but the job is different. As a CEO, you can ultimately make a decision on your own, and you'll bring your team along, but you can make a decision. Often, you know, in, or not often, more, more often than not, in Washington, you need Congress, and you need, obviously, you know, I work for the administration, so make sure that I'm on the same page with the administration, and you need to bring your stakeholders along. So there's a lot of layers of uh, consensus that need to be built, but that's what dem democracy is all about. So was it hard for you to make that adjustment coming from the sector that you came from to go into that bureaucracy of the government? You know what, it's been an honor to do this right. job. It's different, it's, but it's a real honor. I, if you think about it, at my stage of my career, I've been 27 years in the private sector. I never thought I would play a role in the federal government. Uh, but to come in and to be on a vertical learning curve, I mean, our department is responsible for everything from the National Weather Service to the health of our coastlines, to uh, the census, to international trade, to telecommunications uh, uh, policy, to GDP, right. et cetera. And so to have that breadth of things to do and uh, to be engaged with, as well as to have a global role. I've been in oh, 31 countries, probably made over 40 trips around wow. to different countries outside the United States, and I've been all over the country, I think 40 different cities and 25 different states so far. So it's a different kind of job, but, you know, th but what I found is coming in, I came into a department that was really needed, uh, needed some leadership. And so we did like we, I did what I knew how to do in business. I got my team together and said, we need to put together a strategic plan. And we did, we put together our open for business agenda, which is our strategic plan. That's exactly what the country needs. Let's commend you on that. So let's just go into the overall purpose and the role of the Commerce Department. You kind of explained to it a little bit just a moment ago, but what are some of the projects uh, that the department is working on that you know, might surprise some of the people on the audience and those on the web that are listening to us today? So let me step back for one second. So there are four major pillars of what we focus on, trade and investment, uh, which is exports and foreign direct investment. Uh, there's, and under that also falls the travel and tourism policy, et cetera. Then there is innovation. And in innovation, we're involved in manufacturing, we're involved in uh, skilled workforce, and we're involved in the digital economy, uh, both a, a lot of policy making around the digital economy. We're also involved, I think there are two things that would probably surprise people that we do. One is we're a big data agency. We are full of information. And there's never been a major initiative at the Department of Commerce to really figure out how to maximize the value of our data. We make a bunch of our data available, about 10% of the data we have from the National Weather Service. And that would be the other surprise. Right. 
we run the National Weather Service. So you get all your weather information from us. Uh, and we work, at, now, it, typically there's intermediaries between us and the information that you're getting, but uh, we're all the, you know, we're the buoys, we're the sensors, we're the satellites, and we're the algorithms and the computing power that produces the weather forecast. So pretty amazing set of things we do. But data would probably be the area I think people would know the least about that we do. I'm going to get into that in a little bit, too, on that data, so I'll give you a chance to think about sure. that as it comes to security of that data, because I think that's very interesting as we go along. Um, given the economic and political changes facing the U.S. today, what are the priorities for you as the Secretary of Commerce? Well, the priorities, as I said, they really are around, let's take foreign direct investment and exporting or trade. And, you know, one of the biggest initiatives that we have going on right now is trying to pass the Trade Promotion Authority, uh, which is to give uh, the administration guidance as to what do we want to see in our 21st century trade agreements. Uh, and it's a necessary precursor to ultimately doing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will be a major part of our economic foothold in Asia. Uh, and that's a huge priority right now. Another priority is actually legislation that passed, that was um, dropped today, is we also run the Patent and Trademark Association. And uh, we, there's real challenges around the amount of litigation in the area of patents. It's a real impediment to innovation in our country, and we need to really do something. The courts have done, taken some action, but we're, the administration and our department is very much taking the lead on legislation to try and address those challenges. Where do you see that going? That's fairly fascinating, it's this whole patent litigation issue. I mean, people are making big businesses out of it. Um, you know, at the exchange at CME Group, we obviously develop a lot of patents. We've had to hire our own patent lawyers now just to protect our intellectual property and where it can and cannot go. I mean, that's a big concern for companies going forward, is this whole litigation issue over the patents. It's a huge issue, and, and it's a real problem, and it's costing, you know, about 40 million jobs in this country depend upon intellectual property protection. And so it, this is, there's a lot at stake here, and we're very much focused on how to address this uh, litigation, and one of the, you know, there's a limit to what we can do by executive action. It really is going to require Congress to act. We've worked very closely um, with uh, the proposers of the recent patent legislation to try and address the various technical aspects that are allowing for too free a litigated litigation um, potential. Right, right. How can the private sector make the best use of the services of the Commerce Department that it offers for American companies? That it's, it's something that's out there that I think a lot of companies don't utilize enough. So, let me so, give us a little take about how you utilize it more. So let me talk about a couple of things that we do that you may or may not be aware of. We have something called the U.S. Export Assistance Center, which is in about 108 communities around the country. I suspect for everyone in this audience, we're in your community. The job of the folks there is to help you, if you have a product uh, and you want to export that product, to figure out which markets around the world your product is competitive. And then we have foreign commercial service officers in 75 countries around the world, huge teams in some instance. We have maybe 150, 160 people in China that help you navigate in country. And that's a uh, service that gets very good remarks, very good feedback from the service that we offer there. Uh, another service that we have is something called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. So if you're a small manufacturing business, you often are not able to take advantage of the latest technologies that could keep you globally competitive. We actually provide a service working in partnership with local organizations to help small manufacturers have the latest uh, learning technologies, processes, so that they can remain globally competitive. So those are a few things that we do that I'm sure people have no idea about. And the third is one that I talked about, data. We're really trying, I've for the very first time, hired a chief data officer, and we put a team together, and we have a plan to take, I mean, to give you an idea, just the weather service alone, I have somewhere between 20 and 40 terabytes of data a day we produce. We need to make more of that available in a format that can be used 
uh, by businesses for, uh, to make better decisions. We also run something called the American Community Survey, which I promise you, those of you in, in the audience, you're using our data to make decisions about where to locate your properties or better understand uh, uh, the communities in which you want to locate your businesses. And so this is the kind of thing that is not, we're not getting that out there enough. And so that's one of our big initiatives. So I'm gonna go off script just a little bit only because we're in California and the weather is always an issue out here, especially as it relates to the water problems out here. So as they say, you, you know, you can't change the weather, but at the same time, other people believe there's environmental factors that are changing the weather. How much of your department, and this is a question I'm just coming off the cuff with, is involved with the state of California and the issues it's got forthcoming as it relates to not having enough precipitation, not having enough water, and for the people out here? So we're very involved in the sense we're a partner with the state of California and with the local communities in a number of ways. First of all, we do the climate intelligence. So we're giving communities and, and your governors, your mayors, and your county leadership information about what's happening in with you know whether it's droughts or floods or weather information that's necessary to make important decisions in terms of uh, rules and regulations. So that's one way we're extremely involved. The second would be uh, uh, severe weather events. We are we've been working very hard to make sure that we give enough advanced information so that leadership, both business leadership and government leadership, can make informed decisions about how to manage. Think if you're running a railroad business and there's significant severe weather, do I move the train or do I not move the train? Or you're a mayor and there might be you know, sea level rise or something to that effect, how to manage that. But what we've done is we've had to change the way we do our service, and in fact, we're in the middle of a of this process to make sure that we're more and more the in, making sure not just the information is available, but that our expertise is sitting there at the front line with the decision makers so that we can give them the intelligence they need to make informed decisions for their communities. Wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, you wrote a piece for Global Forum, Global Forum's brochure that outlined a concept you call commercial diplomacy. Can you point to one or two instances of commercial diplomacy in action? Sure. Um, we, um, let me just describe commercial diplomacy. The basic concept of commercial diplomacy is, is that there's an overlap in interest between the work, uh, you know, if you think about how does the United States express its national power. We express our national power through our military, through our diplomacy, and then through our commercial diplomacy. The fact that we have enormous economic footprint, American businesses all over the world. So we have, we and the administration with the support of the president and the vice president, we at the Department of Commerce have been around the world working with our business leaders on addressing impediments to doing more business around the world for our American businesses. And it's not just large companies. These are for companies of all different size. And what we found is that when interests overlap, we're far more powerful in terms of effecting change by working together with business leaders. Let me give you an example, yeah. Ukraine. Right. Working with, you know, very challenging situation. They've obviously got the challenge with Russia to their east and their history of not addressing their corrupt environment. And so by working with the business community, we have, have convinced and working with the leadership, both the president and the prime minister in Ukraine to say, you need to pass anti-corruption laws, you need to set up a court to deal with this. There are certain tax laws and customs laws you need to address. And in doing so, if you do, then American business will come. And what I've found, as I said, I've done a lot of international travel. I have yet to meet a leader of a country that does not want more American business present. Why? Because the way we treat our labor, because of the standards that we bring to bear, we work on globally high international standards the way our businesses are required to behave, and that's not always the norm around the world, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And so 
They want our businesses. And then the third reason they want our businesses is corporate social responsibility. So Ukraine might be one place. Turkey is another where we've worked together. I just finished a trade mission, which isn't per se a commercial diplomacy activity, but we went on a trade mission to China with 24 clean energy companies. China has committed in November, President Xi and President Obama committed to uh, make major commitments to reduce their, the carbon footprint of both countries. China committed to have 20% of its energy come from non-fossil fuels. And so as a result, that is the largest clean energy market in the world. They're mm -hmm. spending about $90 billion a year on clean energy. Wow. They're very good at solar. They know how to do wind. They've got strong hydropower. So what we brought is companies, innovative American businesses that complement their strengths to help them reach their own targets. So in essence, what I, as I said to the leadership in China, we want more market share. Right. So that's what being chief commercial advocate means. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit earlier about the data, the data that you have at the Commerce Department. So. I said I wanted to talk a little bit about cybersecurity because it's become so topical, not just in my world of financial services, but in everybody's world, whether you're at AP or the government getting hacked. So cybersecurity is a big issue, and it's an ongoing concern. Every business leader, whether it's in this room or on the web listening to the show or who will watch it later, is worried about it, and with, for good reason. I know that commerce is involved in the, in the government's response as it relates to cyber. Could you talk a little bit about how the government's sure. involved? I, the fundamental belief of our administration is, is that you can't solve cybersecurity all by yourself as a government. We must work together with the private sector, which is why we proposed legislation about three months ago that actually the House has now passed legislation. Right. Uh, uh, and the idea is that for private sector and the public sector to work together to address the challenges of cybersecurity, you as the private sector need liability protection because you need to know what you're getting yourself into right. and make sure you're not exposing yourself by trying to be a good citizen and working with the federal government. So there's pretty interesting legislation that's passed through the House and hopefully will pass through the Senate. Um, in terms of the other thing that we're doing around cybersecurity is we developed um, this uh, critical infrastructure cybersecurity standards. The other thing that we do at the Department of Commerce is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So we set standards for everything, everything from lights to fire hydrants to nanotechnology to nuclear power. And in what we did is create a framework to be used, frankly, originally it was developed to be used by our critical infrastructure, but now it's devolved to be used by the private sector and frankly our both large and small companies to create how do you as a leader of a business think about cybersecurity? What are the issues? How do you work with your chief technology officer to make sure you as the business leader or you as the board are addressing all the various issues attendant to cybersecurity, very complicated issue. It's even complicated, for example, in China, one of the challenges that we face is their, cyber, their proposed cybersecurity regulations have some very, um, some parts to it that will really impede market access for our American businesses. So I was working with the Chinese government when we were visiting to say, look, there are legitimate national security concerns that come with dealing with cybersecurity. But there's also, you, to use cybersecurity as an excuse to impede foreign companies from doing business in your country is another thing. So very complicated issue, very important that the private sector and the public sector work together. Let me go just a little bit off script, because I think it's always interesting when you talk about Washington and you look at a bill going through the House and then hopefully going through the Senate. How much does the president count on you as the Commerce Secretary, as the number one business person in the administration, work with both sides of the aisle, work with the Senate, work with the House to help, you know, take the legislation and move it forward a little bit? Well, it depends on what piece of legislation and is it relevant to what we're working on. But let's take Trade Promotion right. Authority. This is, we have a real whole of, of the administration effort 
Obviously, we're, we at the Department of Commerce are playing a very significant, significant role because it's so critical to what we do. Um, but we're working closely with the Treasury Secretary and his department and working with, obviously, the U.S. Trade Representative because he's out negotiating the deals. Uh, and he's, in fact, been very important on the Hill. But we work very much across the aisle and we're working closely to, you know, this is an important priority for the president. You've seen that he's really leaned in to uh, getting this done, and I fundamentally agree with him. This is a, not a nice to have, this is a need to have. We need to have um, more free trade agreements geared towards Asia. Huge growing market, as you know, yep. uh, but also because there's enormous uh, market access challenges that we, our companies face, that foreign companies do not face coming into the United States. Wonderful. I'm going to talk a little bit about the business and the financial services. I've said this for a while now, and it concerns me as spending my 35 years in the financial services industry, but, you know, we, I've always said we cannot have a strong country if we don't have a strong financial services system, in which we have the strongest in the world. But in the United States today, we're seeing young people, you know, opt out of Wall Street for maybe some of the, all the different reasons that we see. And they're coming back to Silicon Valley to become more entrepreneurial or more innovative. They think that's where the future is. But yet, we're losing some of the best and brightest that Wall Street used to get. And again, I'm a big believer that if you have a strong financial services, it helps with your national security. If you import financial services, you also import the price of that product, but now you're beholden to other countries. So it's, it's really important for us to have a strong financial services, but we're losing young people coming into that industry. So as someone that oversees all businesses, is this a concern of yours? And what do you think about the trend of that happening? Well, I think we need both, to be honest. I right. think it's incredibly encouraging that young people want to go and be entrepreneurs and want Agreed. to innovate and create new businesses. Fully a third of our growth in the United States since 2009 has come from innovation. So we need to continue to encourage that. But you're absolutely right. Our, you know, one of the reasons the United States enjoys the kind of leadership it does is because we do have a strong financial services industry. Access to capital is something that we, uh, it's not take for granted, but is something that really gives us a real advantage uh, globally, and it's not something to be taken for granted. I see many countries around the world, I'm invited often to come and talk about entrepreneurship, innovation, and how do other countries create the opportunity for new businesses to be created and the problem they face is one, they don't have the laws that allow you to easily start or, or, or uh, close a business. Bankruptcy is very difficult either both legally or uh, 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 culturally, but they also don't have the capital system that right. we have. And, you know, we, it, it, taking risk in America is sort of part of who we are. Right. And that's something that is not true in many places around the world. So this is something we have to continue to nurture, and we at the Department of Commerce are very focused on that. Um, one of the things that we're doing, the president started something called the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in um, the next, the fifth one will be in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And one of the things that we're focused on for that summit is that really these are for entrepreneurs throughout uh, Africa, Middle East, uh, and we're trying to work on access to capital is something that is a real area of focus. And I'm hoping that more uh, venture capitalists and more uh, folks from the United States will actually come and see what is uh, what I've seen over the last two years when I've gone to these Global Entrepreneurship Summit is the amazing inventions that are going on in, co in different countries throughout Africa, the Middle East, and you know, places where maybe we haven't ventured as much as we should. Right, I mean, just to further the Secretary's point a little bit, just last week alone, we saw a major influx of money coming into U.S. debt from outside investors, which at these rates that we're paying today, which is zero, is really impressive to, to say that people want that flight to quality to own part of the U.S. debt. So again, it's not like we're paying 10% on our money, we're paying nothing basically, but we saw a big influx coming from outside of the United States again last week, so for the- Jerry, point. what else are you seeing? <laughs> I mean, you're, you, you're, you have a global perspective. I was trying to hope we're gonna get away from you asking me questions, but uh, I'm ready for you, okay. All right. Um, you know, I'm, a couple of different things, you know, 
it's interesting what's going on in the marketplace right now, Madam Secretary. When you look at equity markets basically sitting at historical highs, interest rates sitting at historical lows, then you have gold going nowhere, you know, basically sitting around $1,200 an ounce. You see crude oil, which is another big economic mover, go from $92 a barrel to $46 a barrel in a very short period of time. And then you're seeing geopolitical events like we've never seen in the history of our world happen on live TV, whether it's ISIS or others. And that gets on the third page of the newspaper and it doesn't have an impact on the markets whatsoever. I could tell you from the, my trading years ago, that would have had an influence on the markets for years to come. So I'll give you an example, when Chernobyl happened in the late 80s with the nuclear reactor, people thought that the people of Eastern Europe would never be able to grow anything in that country again. So the grain markets in the United States became very explosive and because we we're going to feed the world. Today, unfortunately, we're seeing these incidents on live TV and yes, people care, but the markets are shrugging them off. And I find it quite interesting to look at equity markets where they're at, interest rates where they're at, energy where it's at, and if that was going on, gold should be at about $6,000 an ounce right now in the old days because people would have had that flight to quality. Not at all. It goes back to what I said earlier, Madam Secretary, they're going into the government debt again at zero interest rates. So it just goes to show you the power of the United States of America right now, and we don't want to have that undermined, but these are interesting events that I've never seen not move the markets like they historically would. So from my line of work, what I always say is that it doesn't last forever and markets will eventually move, and we need to be prepared for it. So you and I had a conversation before we came out here about interest rates a little bit and what should happen. I think Secretary Yellen's doing a wonderful job, but at the same time, the Fed's got to understand that you got to get into some kind of normalized rate environment in case you don't get into this euphoric, let's own America, and nobody buys your debt. You have a, a weak auction one day. And you can't, then you can't move rates when things are bad. You gotta move them when things are good. So unemployment's down to where a more normalized rate, the markets are at a very lofty level. I don't see any reason why she wouldn't wanna take rates, maybe not to historical normalized levels, but to some kind of return. Because you don't wanna have, in my opinion, a bunch of seniors involved in the equity markets and the market sells off 10%, scares everybody, but they're there because they can get no return by owning any um, debt. So. It, it's very interesting where the population of age people are invested today, and they probably shouldn't be invested in some of these products. So it, it scares me a little bit, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it's very, you know, it's, it's consistent with what we're seeing. So let's go back a little bit here. You talked a little bit about being in China, so you just got back from that trade mission, and then you were in India also in January uh, with the president, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I know you traveled to Africa, as you talked about. What opportunities do you see for American companies in these regions? I think it's a very interesting area. I didn't talk too much in my comments about that, but I talked more about U.S. economy. What do you see the opportunities for American companies in these different regions? You know, my observation is the opportunity for American businesses in each country depends upon what that country needs. And, you know, as I said, in China, we went to China with clean energy companies because that's a huge market and they have made huge commitments. In, in Africa, you have six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. And you have a, you know, think about what we were talking about, Ebola. Right. You know, a year ago, it was gonna, you know, overtake the entire continent. And today, it seems to be something, hopefully, that's under control. And so this is a very interesting place where I think more American business uh, has opportunity, particularly in the area of power and energy, agriculture, right. areas like that. Uh, you know, there's, um, and that's a big market, a billion, over a billion people in the continent of Africa, but, you know, it's not one country. Uh, India, we have just formed something, you know, President, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi is, is someone who's brought a lot of optimism and positive uh, attitude towards India. Very complicated bureaucracy that he, and a, and a huge, you know, to run a democracy of um, one, you know, a billion and a half people is right. extraordinary. Uh, but he is a very determined person and very committed to trying to grow foreign direct investment into India. 
The question is, he's got serious challenges to deal with. So we formed a, a, a relationship with India that was announced in January called the Strategic and Commercial Dialogue. We only had where our entire, it's a, how we bring our government to, to bear to engage with India. There's only one other country in the world we have that kind of comprehensive engagement with, and that's China. We have something called the Strategic and Economic Dialogue uh, that Hank Paulson created. So we run the commercial side of the Strategic and Commercial Dialogue in India. It's new, but I think it's extremely important because we need to develop stronger institutional relationships between the United States and India when it comes to the commercial and economic side of our relationship. We have strong uh, political and diplomatic and military relationships, but not on the commercial side to where they ought to be. And particularly if Prime Minister Modi wants to achieve his kind of growth goals, he's got a lot of challenges to address there. So there's work to be done. I'm not suggesting that's an overnight success. I think Mexico is very interesting. I think what, what uh, President Peña Nieto has done in terms of his reforms is very bold. And the fact that he was able to get these reforms through you know, his uh, legislature in order to get a change in your constitution. Imagine changing the constitution no, in the United States. No. You know, it's not so easy. And so he's liberalized the oil and gas uh, market, he's our, our sector, and he's also liberalized the telecommunications. Now, the price of oil will affect that in the short run, but in the long run, there's enormous opportunity for us to work more closely together in, in the energy sector. Um, so I think it's, you have to look sector by sector, and that's where we at the Department of Commerce come in. We have, you know, uh, we have a whole, part of our agency or department that's focused on industry and analysis. Where, where are there opportunities? And then we tend to lead trade missions into markets where we think there's opportunity focused on a sector where that country has need. And so that's one of the services that we provide that I think is, is something that's probably under-recognized by a broad number of companies. More, I've, now it's, I've been on, I think, four trade missions so far since I've been in office, but I haven't been on one where a company doesn't say to me, God, I wish I knew about this a lot sooner because it's really helpful to me to get business done in these countries. Absolutely. Let me stay with that just a little bit. Maybe you could uh, add to that comment about uh, the foreign markets. Do you give advice to companies about how they can navigate with the foreign markets? So you talked about some of the opportunities around the world, but how about advising companies? Do they come to you actually looking for advice about how to, you know, to navigate some of the politics or whatever they need to do to So grow. that's what our foreign commercial service does. They work with Post, so they're part, they're located in the embassy in the various countries, and their job is to work with your businesses and to help you understand the political landscape, the economic landscape, the regulatory landscape, so that you can better navigate we also help you know, with problem solving and ad we also do advocacy. You can apply to the Department of Commerce. You know, since Ron Brown was uh, Secretary of Commerce, he started the Advocacy Center. We do a billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars of worth of advocacy around the world every year. That's where you apply for advocacy and then our center works with the federal government to bring to bear our federal government all the way up to the President of the United States to advocate if you're working on a government procurement uh, initiative in a country outside the United States. Fascinating. Um, I got a few questions left, and then we can maybe just have a, you can ask me a couple if you'd like sure. also. But let me, um, one of the things I think is interesting, how do you help align companies with the notion that their interest coincide with our nation's foreign policy interests. So I think that's a big issue. We have foreign policy interests and then you have to align them from a business side. How do you get that back and forth with the companies? Well, we have, you know, what, one of the things that we have is another tool that we use are you, often like a U.S.-India CEO forum or the U.S.-China uh, uh, or U.S.-Brazil CEO forum. These are different forums and, and there are several dozen of them or a couple dozen of them, and where the U.S. and, let's say, Indian CEOs come together 
and basically advise us as governments, the two governments, what are the policy changes they would like to see collectively, and then we're meant to work on those issues. And frankly, it's extremely powerful because it's in essence guiding us as to what's valuable, right? Because trying to boil the ocean from a policy standpoint is too difficult. So what are the most valuable or high, that, things that we can be doing? We have a, something called the High Level Economic Dialogue with Mexico, it's the same idea. And alongside of that, we have a US-Mexican CEO forum or council that basically advises us as to how to prioritize what do we work on as governments from an economic and commercial standpoint. And to be honest, it's extremely practical. And I work, I have a number of advisory councils. I've got manufacturing advisory council, travel and tourism advisory council. And to, we use, I mean, these are really important functions and we take their advice extremely seriously. And what I've asked, I always ask, I go to the, usually the first annual meeting and then I go when they give me readouts as to their recommendations. Or sometimes I go to them and say, will you help us with this problem? For example, the president uh, asked us to try and improve the entry experience for foreigners into the United States. He didn't ask, you get an executive, it's not an order, but a directive to do this. And so the Department of Homeland Security and I uh, are charged with this. And uh, we went to the Travel and Tourism Advisory Board and went to a number of companies like Enterprise and Marriott and Universal. Said, will you come and work with us and, and anal help us analyze this situation? And then you are excellent at, at customer service. How do we improve the customer experience here? So there's a real partnership that exists between the private sector and the public sector, and we take it very seriously trying to achieve those goals. And frankly, we hold those advisors accountable to be action-oriented and outcome-oriented. They hold us accountable for actually following through. All right. So it kind of wraps up most of my questions, except I do have a couple of the stuff at the top of my head I wouldn't mind asking you if you're okay with that. So one of the things that you know are, is a concern for some, others may not be a concern, is we have several trillion dollars that's stranded outside of the United States and cannot come back. Now, this is not obviously the Commerce Department. I'm asking you more as a business person and what your thoughts are on this. Um, you know, I'm not saying people should put money overseas to avoid taxes and things of that nature, but at the same time, the infrastructure of this country is crumbling. We could use several trillion dollars to come back into the United States and put it into the infrastructure. Labor would like it, everybody would like it. The businesses that have money stranded could bring it back, pay a, a nominal rate instead of trying to pay 85% because no one's bringing it back at 85% or whatever the cost may be. What do you think about having a patriation holiday one time, one time only, try to get anywhere between three and $11 trillion back in here, tax it at a, at a very normalized rate and put it into the infrastructure of this country? I think we need to, I think that's a part of the solution, but it's not 100% of the solution. I think the, um, the administration basically is, uh, has proposed, and there seems to be some receptivity to this, which is to, look, to address what we call business tax reform. And business tax reform encompasses a number of things, including making sure that we, um, and the president put this out in his budget, which is to lower the corporate tax rate to, let's say, between 25 and 28 percent. Right have a repatriation tax the one time for monies that have been earned but have not paid U.S. Right. tax, use that money for infrastructure, and then have some kind of a tax on earnings overseas that is paid when earned as opposed to necessary to bring it back. Because our current tax structure is not globally competitive from both a rate standpoint but also a structure standpoint. Our tax uh, law, as it exists today, encourages you to borrow in the United States and encourages you to leave your cash earned overseas overseas, right? right? right. And so, or your income overseas. So that doesn't make any sense. That's not good for America. So, but I think to just have a repatriation holiday and put the money into uh, 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 infrastructure loses a moment to actually address a bigger problem the United States faces. And so I would broaden the issues a little bit more. 
to uh, address that. And I'm hopeful that it's a priority of the president's. It's a priority of the business community. I think it's a priority of the leadership on Capitol Hill. So we'll see what happens. I agree with everything you said because that was it's critically important for the United States not to have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, but to have a competitive corporate tax rate exactly. in the world. Exactly. I don't know if we'll ever be able to address the personal tax issue because it's so complicated and so many tentacles around and so but this corporate issue can be resolved. So I'm happy to see the president and the rest of the folks in the administration look down this path. That's very encouraging. Yeah, no it is. It is. Um, you know, the question that I would have for you, you obviously are living with the markets and the either lack of volatility in the markets or the volatility that we have in the markets. What do you see or how, it seems the markets are very uh, calm when it comes to uh, some of the things going on in Europe, let's say what's happening with Greece much calmer than we were in, let's say, 2011. Yeah, for sure there is. The markets are much calmer. Um, Bill Gross made a comment, I think it was either yesterday or today, he's one of the biggest bond traders in the world. Sure. Obviously, he left PIMCO, went to Janus. And he said that the liquidity in the bond markets got him extremely concerned because it could be two, three ticks in with a small volume of trade. And, you know, this, unfortunately, the problem with that is when you do have a lack of volatility, you do have a lack of movement, and you have a price that's sitting at the same price for a very long time, most people are either hedged already up at that point and don't need to re reallocate their hedges or change them because of the price has been at the same price. So in return, less participants in the marketplace causes the spreads to widen, unfortunately, but that's what happens. So, you know, when we talk about less volatility and less things of that nature, it actually can hurt the market a little bit. So mm -hmm. no different than when oil went from $100 a barrel to $45 a barrel, we all cheered as we went from paying $5 a gallon at the pump to $2.40 a gallon pump. We don't realize that there was also some repercussions on the downside for businesses uh, of that product. So as much as I was happy to pay less for my gas, there's actually some downsides, uh, downside for the economy as it relates to those price fluctuations back and forth. So, you know, I think right now the, when you look at just like the VIX volatility rate in Chicago that they trade at the SIBO, it's down around 13, 13 is the number, very low volatility going on right now in the marketplace. Not uncharacteristic to what I said earlier. People just are not trading when they see the markets not moving. So they're sitting in ranges right now. And yes, it could be good for certain policies. Like I said, you can keep interest rates low. We can get a big influx of money coming in, buying our debt. But ultimately, things will change, and they'll change in a hurry. Terrific, terrific. So I know our time is getting uh, a little short here. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to make a comment. I think that, you know, being around Washington for a long time and watching administrations, I don't think there's anybody more qualified to be <laughs> Commerce Secretary than you. I think everybody knows the history of your family, but I don't think a lot of people understand the history of Penny Pritzker uh -huh. and what you've been able to accomplish on your own, which is Thank amazing. You. So congratulate Secretary Pritzker. Thank you. I appreciate it very much, and Thank thanks you. for being here. Terry, thank you very Th much. Thank Terrific. you. Thank you all Terrific. very much. Thank you.